Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming by our Jane, virtual JaneCon 2021 presentation on Swords and Swoons, the Weapons of Captain Frederick Wentworth. I'm uh, Franklin Wilson Hernandez Knight III. Uh, I'm a former martial arts instructor and stage combat instructor, and I've been training in historical martial arts and sword fighting for quite some time. Uh, so I want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about uh, Captain Wentworth and the weapons he would have used when he was abroad fighting in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so to do that, let's first look at who Captain Wentworth is as a military man. Everybody knows that you know he is the love interest of Anne Elliot in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, but since the book doesn't expressly say details about his military career, we have to figure some of that stuff out. Now, we can figure out that he joined the military at some time before 1806, since he was already enlisted when he met Anne for the first time. And we know that he returns in the kind of present day of the novel in 1814, after he served in the Napoleonic Wars, and he comes back with uh, 2,500 pounds of prize money to his credit, making him quite a catch. Now for those who are not familiar with Napoleonic Wars, prize money was gained by the benefit of selling the goods from ships that you had captured. So this means he would have had to have been part of capturing French vessels and selling off their goods to receive his prize money. And when he joined the Navy in uh, the early 1800s, that was also around the same time as a slew of changes occurred to the standards. The standard uniforms, the standard weapons were all changing during that Napoleonic time. In fact, uh, as we can see in this image provided by swordfight.uk, this is when epaulets became a standard part of the military uniform for the Navy seamen which is wonderful because that means in the 95 version of Persuasion, we have this wonderful outfit worn by Wentworth. This is his dress uniform. You can see because of the, the white lapels, all the wonderful gold trim and filigree. And this is not the outfit he would have worn on ship all the time. This is the outfit he would have worn when, you know, going to a ball or important military functions and the like. And of course, this is probably the outfit that most people want to make if they're pursuing costuming. For me, this outfit was a particular goal of mine because my wife who got me into Jane Austen's, her favorite film is Pride and Prejudice. And I thought it would be a wonderfully cute couple's costume if I could eventually figure out how to do this costume. But before I did that, I had to do a whole lot of research on other little things. Uh, as a person of interest with uh, history and swords, I was wondering what sword goes with this outfit? What's the appropriate accessory for this? Uh, and then I found out that there is a regular daily shipwear outfit we also see in the film. This outfit is more subdued. This is the one, of course, when he's writing his letters. And it does not have the white lapels. It is all the navy blue. Most of the gold accents are gone. The sleeves are different, and this is kind of the daily use wear that he would have every day on the ship. Um, but no matter which outfit he was using, he would have had a sword hanging on his hip. Uh, so my question was, what sword goes with that outfit? And uh, interesting fact, the answer is a bunch of different swords, especially depending on exactly when uh, in the Napoleonic Wars we are talking about. This right here is the 1803 uh, pattern naval officer saber. This saber is based on the 1803 pattern that they used for mounted cavalry in the army. It has a wonderful lion's head motif on a, what would have been at the time, a ivory whalebone or even like a ray skin white handle and it was a vast improvement as far as the 
Navy officers were concerned over the previous Sabres, um, or actually this previous Spadroons, the sidearm that would have been uh, carried previous to this. Uh, this is an example right here of the 1796 officer's Spadroon. A lot of people don't like that one, but the benefit of that is you can get really cheap replicas of that. So this is a really inexpensive, I think it was maybe $40 online, um, just a replica Spadroon. This one is a single-edged saber, and that is kind of where my looking into these began so that I have something on the costume as I slowly built it. Now, uh, this sword has beautiful filigree on the blade and some examples even have a thing called bluing, which is a heating treatment done to the blade to give it a blue sheen. And if we look at some of these other spadrons from the Georgian period, we can see that. Um, spadrons came in all shapes and sizes and some of them were very bemoaned as a poor sword, and some of them are thought of as a wonderful sword these days. Um, and at the time period, when the Spadroon was popular, everybody loved it until they changed to a new sword, and then everybody liked the new sword better. Um, the ones on the outside edges of this image are called five ball Spadroons, and these were very common in the Georgian period, uh, especially for things like the East India Trade Company and such. But as you can see with the rightmost one, that one has wonderful gold filigree, and you can see the bluing of the blade um, still in that example. The one in the middle, though, is very interesting to me because it has the double shell guard, like the Spadroon I showed you in the previous image, and kind of like this really cheap replica I have here where there's little hand guards here. But the one in the image has this interesting feature that I've only seen on certain Spadroons where the shell guard can actually fold flat. So that way, when you're wearing it against your fancy outfit, it lays on your hip nice and cleanly, like the Georgian five ball spoons that don't have the double shell. But when used as a sword, it has the appearance of a full hand guard. Unfortunately, because of that hinge, the full hand guard is not really that protective when actually used in combat. Uh, it is more of a decoration. So that brings us to the idea that did naval officers have fashion swords? And in actuality, yes, pretty much all um, officially issued swords for the Navy were kind of in a way for fashion because that's not necessarily the weapon they would use in like ship to ship combat per se. So while it's very likely that Wentworth had a lovely 1800s naval officer sword like this with you know a blue blade and wonderful filigree because of his uh, 2500 pounds that he earned while at sea you know i'm sure he had the finest equipment you know if you were to go to a ball or a military function but to earn that 2500 pounds he probably used a cutlass so this right here is the napoleonic era seaman's cutlass now, I'm sure when most people hear the term cutlass, they think of the curved, short pirate sword that we see in, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean films or, you know, any sort of older B-movies and such or at the dollar store in the Halloween section. But for the Napoleonic era, uh, the majority of cutlasses were actually straight, giving them the ability to cut and thrust and to be used in, in essence, the same techniques as the other swords, the more fashion-y swords, but these had much stronger and sturdier elements. The blade is much wider, the handguard is much, the handguard is much long, uh, larger. Uh, in fact, the handguard on this is called a figure eight guard, which is a funny little thing. It's called that because when the piece of metal is laid flat, the two circles that make up the guard appear like the number eight, and then you just fold it in half and you have one circle on top guarding your hand and one circle in front guarding your knuckles. The grip of this, instead of being something fancy like bone or ivory or ray skin, is just cast iron in kind of what we would refer to these days as kind of like a grenade grip, a, a textured cast iron surface so that 
it wouldn't be too slippery when wet fighting on board ship. Um, and these were used often during boarding expeditions when, you know, a British vessel would try and board, say a French vessel during the Napoleonic Wars. But just because the majority of them were straight swords doesn't mean they all were. During my research, I was able to find two excellent examples of a, an official uh, authorized naval cutlass with what is called a falchion blade, which is a thicker curved blade, giving it slightly more, as you can see the, as the tip just starts to bend up there, slightly more of that pirate cutlass feel. Um, and it would make the sword much stronger in the cut. Uh, there are other forms of cutlasses during this time period, especially for use by either the police or soldiers on foot. Uh, but often the term hanger was used on land and were cutlass on sea, but often they're similar, if not the same swords. But no matter if you were on land or being used at sea, all the military officers would have been trained in a very similar British military saber system. And there's versions of this for the Highland regiments that would use a Highland broadsword, the regular sabers, uh, and a variety of other things. So if you want to learn to fight like Wentworth, or dare I say, Wickham, as you can see by all these red coats here, uh, there are some amazing resources available online to do so. Uh, particularly if you're here on YouTube, you should check out the uh, Academy of Historical Fencing or Scola Gladiatoria, both based out of the UK. Um, most of these images come from treatises provided free online by those two wonderful groups. And we can actually look at some of those treatises. Uh, the Academy of Historical Fencing and Swordfight.uk have been doing a great job of preserving some of these original Ma training manuals and treatises from the time period. Uh, this is a wonderful example of when they actually go page by page and photograph each page of the book that you can see. Uh, and it's wonderful when they do that, but sometimes because they don't have those books in their libraries, they um, have to do other means like scans. So these are scans of images from those original books that are here to illustrate the proper way of performing the motions, since these documents are predominantly written out in prose, the very few images that are included in them help you understand exactly what's going. So our opponent here is taking a cut at the leg, and we are withdrawing our leg so it is out of the range of their cut, and simply reposting with a little cut to the wrist. These, a lot of these official military manuals are very prim and proper, have really good posture, uh, and are very kind of I idealized versions of sword fighting. Um, but not all of the manuals have such beautiful artwork. If you look at our next slide, uh, some of it is a little cruder. Uh, this time we are seeing somebody parrying a thrust from a bayonet on a rifle and reposting with a killing thrust to the heart of their opponent. Um, but this is still not terrible. Um, but they go even farther. So this one is a favorite of mine, even though it looks like a, a little Crayola crown drawing. Uh, this very crude drawing indeed comes from uh, one of my favorite newly discovered treatises, uh, the 1812 sword treatise by Lieutenant uh, William Green. And he put this treatise out uh, during the end of the Napoleonic War which means these are techniques that he developed while fighting in the Napoleonic War. And uh, he was actually stationed on the HMS uh, Conqueror at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. So he served kind of in the same period as Wentworth. Um, unfortunately, unlike Wentworth, he was not a British man who made his way during the war. He's actually a Canadian, which is fun. And his treatise is really interesting because unlike the very structured treatises going over cut and repose systems of the other 
manuals. His treatise is based on actual battlefield experience, and he has all these fun little tricks for kind of how he survived the war. And in this wonderful image, uh, which is also on the cover of the book, we can see he is using his flintlock pistol in his left hand as a defensive weapon against the cut from somebody's sword. The way that officers were taught to board ships in the time were as you were boarding, you would draw your pistol in your right hand, shoot once with the bullet that's already ready, toss the pistol away into the water, and then draw your sword and continue trying to board the ship. Uh, he found that to be very impractical at the time in the chaos of boarding ships you would often miss with the shot and it would go to waste so he recommended that you draw your sword in your right hand and your pistol in your left and you board the ship pushing your way on with your saber out or your cutlass and then once you're in actual combat range uh, once you're point blank that's when you'll file fire your pistol because you're much more likely to hit something that way and then you will continue to use it as a pairing device. Uh, the wonderful thing is in movies and action films, we often see people wielding swords or knives in a reverse grip, in a stabbing position, so that they can block and defend and parry that way. Um, but for knives and stuff like that, it's not super useful. But what's really fun is that's the way he recommends holding your pistol. Hold your pistol backwards against your forearm so you can defend yourself with it and still cut with the sword. He also has wonderful techniques on things that are very useless to us now, but uh, he has these wonderful crude drawings of different ways of boarding ships or defending from being boarded, how to deal with uh, two ships boarding one ship and all kinds of fun things, including uses of pikes and um, these wonderful kind of belaying axes that they used at the time for actually um, one side would be an axe, this side would be a pick, and you'd slam the pick side into the side of a ship, and then you'd use two of them, and you'd climb up the side of the ship uh, with these boarding axes. It was very interesting. So what I want to do is I want to leave you guys with this wonderful uh, period naval cutlass cutting exercise where you can see kind of how the motions worked out for people and how you could practice your different cuts and your different angles. And you can uh, use anything you have around your house for these. So if you have the spatula or wooden spoon or a pencil or a broom handle, you can kind of practice making these cuts and these footworks with yourself and see if this is something that you would be interested in. And if it is something that you would be interested in, uh, I would highly recommend there are tons of educational videos on YouTube by the Historic Fencing Academy and Skull of Gladiatoria. If you go to the swordfight.uk, where a lot of these images are, you can look at these original treatises, these two right here, ones that I've specifically referenced uh, and got images from putting this together. Or uh, if it's a little too hard to understand when you read the treatise exactly what they're trying to get your body to do, because it is, as I said, mostly in prose form, there are, of course, wonderful instructional videos from these online creators. And also it's worth looking in your area, depending on when you live, there's often um, some type of historical uh, sword fighting academy in your area. Uh, there's even a Facebook group for specifically uh, historical Napoleonic combat. So, so wonderful, wonderful resources for people who wanna learn more about kind of the sword fighting aspect of Wentworth. Overall, the one thing I really learned when first looking into this is that when we discuss Jane Austen, we often talk about the Regency period. But for things like men's military fashion, if you do searches for Regency Navy outfits, sometimes you get details, sometimes you don't, sometimes it's very hard because most of the enthusiasts for the Napoleonic era are using that term. So when doing the research, it's important to make sure, you know, search for Napoleonic swords, Napoleonic military uniforms, and you'll get a lot more returns, even though they're the same time period. <laughs> but so thank you very much for coming and listening to me ramble a little bit about swords and what were different outfits in the films. 
Uh, you can, of course, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm at Frank Knight with a K on all of those. And I hope you had fun and enjoy the rest of Virtual Gen Con 2021.